Okay, so we're in 2021 already. And it's here. We're already halfway through January, if anyone is also surprised like I am. Um, again, thank you for taking your time um, to join us today. We're gonna be looking at our nonprofit tech and marketing trends for this year. And I'm Jenna Dillette. I work with Square Operations Manager. I've been in generally the technology space since 2015. And um, I am surprised by that in a lot of ways because in general, I like people and I've done a lot of things with that. I've been a reporter in the past with a um, fundraising manager for a nonprofit before being on the tech side of the table. And so it's a privilege to get to talk with you all about the trends that we're seeing and um, hopefully what that could mean for your organization. Um, like I mentioned, I work with Square. We are based generally in Dallas, but also what does that mean if we're all remote? It means we can be based anywhere. <laughs> we work specifically with nonprofits and member associations providing technology strategy, hosting and maintenance, ongoing support, outbound mail support, and in specific software, which you see Drupal, Civi, and Salesforce. And so you can learn more about us at square.com. But more interesting, who are you and why are you here? Maybe you are the marketing team for your organization, or maybe you don't really have a marketing team and, and you're really trying to think about new opportunities or you're new to your job or you're in charge of all the fundraising efforts that are happening. My goal and hope for today is that everything that we talk about, the purpose will be to raise awareness to have you see a little bit of what's already happening in the world and how does what's happening relate to how you and your team engage your community and, and live out your mission. So how can you see opportunities and basically do the same thing in the same old way or maybe see a way to do the same thing in a new way um, to have a different impact and to live out what you're doing. And where I wanna start is before I dive into a bunch of specifics, is this resource. I feel like this is my favorite favorite resource right now that I've been going to for about three months. And um, one of the organizations that we work with at Square gets credit for it, which you should also check out. They're called Hosts for Humanities. And um, they're kind of a, a brand new organization that's kind of the like an Airbnb, but for those who are traveling because of um, some sort of medical emergency. And um, the team that put that nonprofit, that organization together, then they all happen to work professionally within the usability space. And there's been a lot that um, I know I've learned from them, just the fact that they're, the mission and what they do um, is benefiting so much from the fact that they have all these heuristics in mind. And so I'd also encourage, I know you're all in front of a computer right now, to check out nngroup.com. Um, and I put the link at the bottom of that slide, the nngroup.com, and then their usability heuristics. And I want to actually take a moment before we dive into more general broad trends to kind of walk through these. When I said in the beginning about how I hope today can be um, a way for you to kind of see the old in a new way or see opportunities that exist, I think that the um, this guide and their kind of 10 usability rules in a sense um, can be this foundation for the way you think about and look at your work. So we'll just run through, there's 10 of them, and then we'll run through 10 more things of other completely separate things. But I want to I touch on each of these. So um, their number one rule about the visibility of system status. Um, you can think about that as an indicator in life of like, you are here on a map, that if you see a map, you're looking in a park, you're in an airport, the dot you are here in a guide for what's next. And we can think about that with our systems um, and the technology that we're building, the way we're having people flow through the environments that we engage with them online. How can they know where they are? Um, what is the status that they have within the system? Um, the second one is great, match between the system and the real world. So anything that you are doing, hopefully you're doing it in a way that you're speaking your users languages, that you're using um, words, phrases, concepts that are familiar to, um, to the user already and you're not redefining a word that already has a definition. So like I said, these are kind of specific rules, but if hopefully you all have um, the website pulled up and we'll kind of star that to look at later because I think these um, usability heuristics can be such a solid base for then everything else that we talk about during, um, during this training together. And so the, the concept for number two is just never assume that your understanding of words or concepts will match those of your users um, to use what, what people already know. The next one is about user control and freedom. And it's about how within our online spaces, 
people make mistakes and we know that and then they can get lost or confused and that's why you have a health number maybe someone's signing up for membership or they're trying to make a donation and something unexpected happened or they navigated to a space within um, within your website that is not where they intended to be and so an example for what it means to give a user control and freedom is how within your digital spaces you can have kind of that emergency exit just like we have in our physical spaces um, how can you get out of here um, the fourth one, consistency and standards. This is, this is my favorite. <laughs> so there's this kind of this law within this usability space that people spend most of their time using digital products other than yours. <laughs> so, so we're talking today about how you can get more attention, more engagement, increase the impact. And um, we can also recognize at the same time that um, that people are spending the minority of their time in your space, right? We spend our time holistically across all kinds of different platforms and spaces and in person. And so um, that means that a, user's, a user experience and their expectation of your environment is actually set separate from your environment. It's set by every other tool, every other space that they're using. And kind of the behemoths in some way are leading that, like Google search, autocomplete searches, um, different standards that exist somewhere else because of some sort of massive technical team and, and budget that that entity has, but then because of people's experiences in those environments, they take those expectations into your space. And so um, behave like everybody else in a sense, right? How we, how we can stand out, um, but not have the usability of a website be something that people have to make up new within your environment. And the last one here is error prevention. And um, I used to always talk about, oh, we can solve that with help text, <laughs> right? Like if, if something seems confusing, let's throw a sentence underneath it and explain it away with help text. But um, good design within your online spaces in whatever online space that is, should be hopefully preventing errors from occurring. Um, so then you don't even have to have that sort of help text. So, um, the next one, we'll get through these 10 and then we'll go kind of big picture. But I really hope everyone pulls up that article and spends some time with it because it's also about um, can benefit even your processes internally, how you communicate with each other. Um, if there are more efficient ways for you to, to do the same um, process within your organization and not just looking at the communication that you have with your external community. So their sixth rule is about recognition rather than recall, which basically means minimizing the amount that your user has to remember. So um, the longest I've worked anywhere is in public libraries. So spanning all of high school, all of college. And um, I know the Dewey Decimal System really well, but also libraries know that other people don't. And so they will like label pets, you know, and label cooking <laughs> cookbooks. So someone isn't expected to remember what number in the Dewey Decimal System that is. So how can you offer help within the context that it's needed within your environments? Um, another way to do that is with their seventh rule of flexibility and efficiency for use. We can think about that with shortcuts. Um, and how people, if they are really tech savvy, maybe don't need to go through a whole process that you have within um, your website and that there's certain processes and maybe an online form or an application or a membership sign up. Um, an example of this would be often you can give people quicker access to things if they can first log in to your system and then they can much more efficiently complete an action instead of having them first um, go through this whole process, fill in a bunch of information that they already know about you. So think about those shortcuts and, and the way um, that can divide your audience into kind of two different groups, those that are completely new to you versus those that are have a known relationship and that you have information about them. The, the eighth is about design, right? It's less is more. The, and we know that. And I think um, design standards, and you see that with the beautiful templates in Squarespace or Wix, um, how much more simple the interface is in comparison to looking at a website from the 90s, which is a small print and long menu options, lots of words. Um, and that, that I think is becoming more and more the standard and we see that changing even with um, new app development or your space. And so always holding that in priority with less is more. And you'll we'll get to some um, specific audiences then when we get into more of the what's ahead um, to know why this especially matters when you're when you're reaching out to a new audience. 
And then um, the, the last two are pretty similar about helping users recognize from their own errors. So um, basically this is where your, your tech partner comes in play. You know, um, if there's a way to, if there's an error message, have it be in English and not code. Um, and what can be done if a user is experiencing um, some sort of error within your system? How can that be expressed within plain language and give them a way out um, to take the action that they are intending to take? And then lastly, um, that the best system doesn't need any documentation, right? Um, that it's, it's very obvious how to use it. Um, and so whenever possible, then if you do need to provide help, support, guidance, in some sort of form or application process or donation flow that you present that support within the context and in the moment that the user is taking that kind of action. Um, just to minimize the things that a person is having to juggle and think about in order to engage with you. So now that <laughs> we've kind of taken an immediate side trail because this has been, like I said, my favorite resource for the last three months because I think these usability um, guidelines. Um, they touch on so many different things that we do within our work. And I do think that um, spending some time with them can create this kind of foundation for how um, you're thinking about interactions and what you're building, where you're spending your money and your technology investments, and then also as a backdrop to now everything we're going to talk about ahead. So let's shift gears a little bit and kind of look at the some 10 10 of the um, marketing trends. So we're staying virtual. I officially, as of last week, signed up um, and am now paying money for virtual yoga. I was holding out all last year and it's like the best um, $40 a month now I'm spending and it's not, it's not strange at all. <laughs> so I think there's a benefit where we're all getting more used to the fact that this is how, this is where we've had to be. Um, there's going to be more straddling of in-person gatherings, but still, um, uh, an appropriate not readiness for that to scale. And so even if you're having something small that is in person, are there opportunities for you to add a virtual component to it? Um, I think a lot of the, you probably saw some of the savings that virtual brought, right? That there's some major event costs like venues that are no longer um, needed. Or I know um, my brother, he works in visual audio, and he was talking about how the standards for video quality have significantly changed. You know, we're working in our kitchens, we have our pets running through our screens, and it turns out we all still have the same brains, even if we're showing up in a different physical space, and that we respect each other's brains, right? Because this is, this is the way and how we show up to work. Um, so this is, this is going to stay. We're going to continue to be virtual and um, to, to embrace that and to think about that as that was part of your strategy forced last year. And now it can be intentionally part of your strategy moving forward. Um, and there can be the benefits from that of the engagement that you can have with this bigger community like we can even have today. Since it doesn't matter where you're calling in from, you could be awake in the middle of the night on the other side of the world and just wanting to learn. So next up is, here comes Gen Z. So who is that? that that's the generation that was born um, in 1996 and later after that. And as of 2021, they will be 25. And so um, this generation is the most socially conscious generation that has existed yet. <laughs> Say yet, who knows what's ahead of us. Um, they're also, you'll see at the prime age for charitable giving and the way to engage that charitable giving. There's a, I saw this great article um, about philanthro philanthro teens. It's a word that's better read than <laughs> trying to say out loud, philanthro teens of um, young people using pocket money to change the world, right? The way that um, folks can individually have pride and, and own something that they really care about. And then the way that they share that with their community. So um, a generation where self-proclaimed being very entrepreneurial or especially socially entrepreneurial and how you can engage this, these folks who are growing up like all of us in your work. So do you need new board members? Um, what sort of volunteer opportunities do you have? And also part of communicating to generation is what channels are you in and how is your message? This is sort of the, the end of the word document era, right? <laughs> of This is having short engaging um, messaging, um, clear calls to action and in the appropriate channel where this, um, this community is, this audience is, which is in most ways, social media and the changes in social media that exist. 
So related to that, how is digital advertising changing? And we saw a lot of changes in 2020 where Instagram, they broke a billion users. TikTok took off in the United States with over hundred million active users. SMS marketing is on the rise. Um, if you just stop and think about all the different kinds of text messages you get, then you'll probably realize how much more you engaged, opted in, gave out contact information to organizations that are engaging you in a new way. A lot of that is the um, a shortened distance between kind of the click to donate, sort of the like the Amazon checkout process of, I want to buy immediately in the middle of the night. <laughs> you know, that button should like go away after 11 p.m. or something. <laughs> but we're making that easy now, translating that for in the nonprofit giving space of making it that much quicker to um, give donations through, say, SMS marketing of with accounts set up correctly, making that easy for your donors. So what are, what are the channels that you're already in? How are you doing in those channels? Uh, because you have options and um, the social media landscape is changing and um, there's some great tools that you can use for that. So this is a, a great tool, shout out TechSoup, where you can even um, take an assessment for your digital marketing. You can check that out um, to just to see and share what you're already doing and get some tips on what you can do next based on um, what's in your landscape. And then there's also a variety of these tools. And a lot of these are about managing your social media presence. Um, I've used Hoots, Hootsuite and Canva um, and for, you know, in the past, and those both work really well to basically see everything in one place um, and not have to log into the individual separate channels to then allow you to have more of um, the clear vision always of what your strategy is, what you're talking about. Are you sharing things consistently across your different environments at the same time? Um, track your analytics, be able to pull reporting to then share with your boss, with your board, with your coworkers, the impact that the time spent within those channels is having. And on the other side, to, to get out, to back out, if man, this time is not worth it, let's do something else. Um, that's where the analytics matter and being able to put everything within one place can add value. So, um, and I think all of these to some degree have um, kind of trial options or are free. And so there's that low risk where it's not like you're having to put a lot of money on the table in order to see what benefit um, you can get that your organization can get from these tools. The next is email segmentation. Um, I particularly like this because I, I live in CRM systems, right, for work. So I think about data structure and custom information that's being collected by this organization that's different from this other organization. Um, we are sending more and more emails all the time. What, like 300 billion emails every day is the latest stat. <laughs> Fortunately, they're not all in your inbox, <laughs> but globally. <laughs> so that's a lot of email um, that if we could translate that into mail that we get, like right now, somehow, maybe someone stole my identity. I get a lot of mail about Medicare. And I mean, you can judge my appearance. I'm not eligible for Medicare yet. <laughs> I don't know how I got on that list. The junk mail that we get, if we think about that from a digital perspective, there's a lot of emails that are filling our inbox, even from organizations that we care about that we are not opening and we're not reading. And so that means it's time to really look at your email lists. One, always make sure that you're honoring opt-ins, um, that that's an actual, that's a law, <laughs> a federal law that, um, people need to opt in in order to see certain kinds of notifications from you. And, um, and then besides that, the way that you can further segment to then personalize your message. Why are you sending this message to this group of people? Um, you know, maybe that message would be better suited to another group of people. Um, and so the, I see the question, the only way that you can really act on this is to take a look at your data. How is your data structured? Can you put together folks that attended at events, that gave you donations, that have engaged in some sort of campaign, um, have signed up for special communications from you? Can you put all of those pieces of data together in one place? You have a CRM system that allows you to do reporting and filtering in order to 
actually see and this um, relatively homogenous groups <laughs> put in your people together to then have target communications. Um, I know that one of the organizations we work with, the International Mountain Bicycling Association, their end of year campaign every single year, they are segmenting more and more and more. And I think they ended up creating something like 12 or 13 different online donation forms um, at the end of last year for the end of year giving campaign that then they were sending that had slightly different language, a slightly different default donation value on the form um, that were quick to set up. You know, it's just sort of a, a copy of the same form over and over and then making tweaks to those forms and then having a lot of different emails that are going to a smaller group of people. But instead of asking all donors for a base gift of $50, maybe this group of donors should be asked for a base gift of $250 and this other group of donors, a $5 recurring donation. So that's the, the, um, the benefit of, of segmenting and you can only do that um, if you look at your data structure. So there's a lot of work required and a lot of review required before um, you can take advantage of this. Um, but you know, I mean, uh, count at the end of the day, how many new deleted emails you have within your folder. And that can be a motivation to take, take this one especially um, serious in terms of how you're, you're interacting with your audience. This next one, and I apologize, I, I found that photo and I just had to use it. <laughs> so video content, I'm so glad this is the most terrifying, um, you know, like mock product that exists, the birthday stick <laughs> of engaging people in all the most important times of your life. Um, but the, the point is serious about video really does rule that as of this year, video is expected to make up 82% of online traffic. And so there's, there's so many different ways um, to incorporate that in. So I'm on, a, I'm on a tread desk right now. I have a standing desk with the, you know, the fancy treadmill under. And I've thought about what if for Square, I would do like Tuesday tread talk where I just like walk on my treadmill and I talk into a camera for three minutes or, you know, I think like I was sharing before and I know from my brother and what he's shared, we have a different expectation about the quality of video. And I know several years ago when there was all this push, you know, of um, video always increasingly growing over year, over year, um, but that the quality mattered in a different way. And that has been a gift of COVID where because we are all home, we're growing beards, we're not cutting our hair, it's our brains that matter, <laughs> you know, that um, we, we can have more fun in the way that we present our video content of what's the behind the scenes of what your organization is doing, or um, what's the impact of what giving has been. Um, what's the, the newsletter, the virtual newsletter of maybe your um, executive director sharing that into a, you know, a Facebook live um, for two minutes instead of typing out a long multi-paragraph update. How can you incorporate um, video in a lower risk way? I, I laugh too about the way, um, the discomfort with Zoom and people not wanting to turn on their cameras. And I'm not like passively saying all of you that don't have your cameras turned on should turn them on. <laughs> you can leave them off. But that somehow um, it's this different expectation about who, who we can be in a video versus who we are in real life, right? Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna eat on camera because I don't want to see people eat or like see me eat, but I go to restaurants with people. So it's like, there's still this hump that we need to get over of the comfort that we have in a screen. Like somehow I'm just weird if I'm not three-dimensional and that none, none of you, none of us are weird <laughs> in, our, in our video form. And that there's a lot more that we can do with it in um, sharing engaging updates and um, just communicating about the impact that, um, our volunteers or donors are having in the work that we're doing. The next is about re-engaging all those lapsed donors. So overall donations were up in some ways, but they were definitely down. That they, um, a lot of organizations, they lost, they lost a lot of their um, donors this last year where donations became smaller. And so this goes back to segmentation um, and how you, can, can, do you even know who your lapsed donors are? Do you have a system that can, um, that can tell you that? Do you have reporting capabilities to know? And if you don't, that would be something to immediately invest in <laughs> or immediately seek training support in your CRM system so you can pull that. So you can divide your contacts again into this relatively homogenous group <laughs> of people. Um, and I have realized I've not checked chat for a while. So let me see if anything is happening there. 
great. Okay. Looks like, yay, CRMs. <laughs> um, yes, that, that will keep coming up. Like there's, with all of these, there's so much work that um, happens in the background to live these out, which is why there could be an, an individual session on almost all of these. And there will be in the future. I'll, I'll share the schedule again of what um, trainings we have coming up. And so looking at your lapsed donors, this um, completely relates to what we had talked about with segmentation and having compelling messages. This is also about your donation process. Um, do you have a payment processor and an online interface that makes for easy um, reoccurring donations or making it easy for someone who was a lapsed donor um, to be known by your system to quickly make a donation? Um, I know in our work, we, we think a lot about tokenized links for basically your, your smart CRM system being able to send you a link that is unique to you. So when you click on it, it's auto-filling information partially that um, already exists, which then can be easier to um, fill in the rest of the information that's required and, and press donate of how can you remove as many steps um, that are needed between contacting someone and then having them take action, having them open their, their digital wallet and support the work that you're doing. And then your sustainers, then this is about reoccurring gifts in particular. And this, those stats are from Classy about just the difference between a one-time donation versus monthly reoccurring. And it's not difficult math to see how much more that adds up over time, how many more dollars. And I think the most important statistics, and again, this is just from Classy, but I think even if it's a plus or minus 10, that's huge. Within one year of signing up, reoccurring donors make additional one-time gifts of 75% more often than your one-time donor. So that, I mean, I, I know that's the case for me when I think about um, organizations that I was especially involved in in the past. And when I had something set up as reoccurring, how much more I was staying in the know about the work that they were doing, just because I was part of their reoccurring donor group, they had a specific communication strategy to keep reoccurring donors in the know. Because of that additional engagement, I wanted to support more in unique ways or support some special project that maybe my reoccurring gift was to general funds to a general donation. And so again, the, the next step for this would be, what infrastructure do you already have in place to support this? Um, how clean, clear is it? Um, how, how prominent is it? Um, and, and how can those dollars be directed even in um, thinking of sort of a campaign way of having even reoccurring gifts benefit specific elements of your work to then make the potential for that stand out even more in comparison to just your general donation asks. So to really tie it to where you need the most support and involvement in the work that you're doing. This one it does need to be a presentation. So Adrian, <laughs> mark, mark on your on your notes about how much can be said about AI and chatbot chatbots and the Internet of Things. So now, even if you didn't know that acronym, now you can know that if you ever see IoT, that means the Internet of Things. So those are all your smart devices that surround you, and depending on how you cough, um, may talk and say, "What what sort of support do you need? What can I order online for you?" <laughs> Shall I turn the oven on? All of the smart devices that we're surrounded by and that um, it's, it seems like it's been owned by kind of the, the business space, but it's not. Um, that there's a lot of nonprofits who have already been in the space and the use of chatbots that you see already on a lot of websites to help automate questions that instead of going to an FAQ page, there's some sort of little chatbot in the lower right hand corner. Um, this is where your existing website partner can come into play. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of tools that can be used to help with this. Um, and the, the flow for thinking about how you could best benefit from this. So what are some of the regular questions that um, your team is having to answer? Or how can you help direct people to the correct member of your team and use a chat bot to help with that? So then that question goes directly into that staff member's inbox instead of going through one, two, three processes before it gets in the right place. Um, I know of a lot of organizations that are using this to help connect with, um, especially human service organizations, connecting with services in a different way, um, a way to also be anonymous in engagement. So depending on the nature of your work, 
Um, maybe it's important from a safety perspective that a lot of information isn't shared up front before someone can know if they can get support. Um, I think of an organization we work with that supports victims of domestic violence and the way that they have used chatbots within their website to create a safer space for people to get help and in a way that can't be tracked then on a phone if say a boyfriend takes a phone and looks at it. So there's, there's a lot of transformational things that can be done with AI and all of these new tools that are available and not increasingly either free or low cost. Um, that's not just in a for-profit space. This is not just businesses um, that are benefiting from this. And it's also not just big nonprofits that can take advantage. Um, I think if you start looking around and um, kind of see, especially chatbots and how, how much more frequently they exist, kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit is how long um, Facebook Messenger has been around, right? And the way that that can be integrated in with your website and most organizations having some sort of Facebook presence and to almost start light. Um, another concept I came across uh, when I was putting together this tiny little slide that a lot of time could be spent on <laughs> in talking about is this idea of micro moments. Um, and uh, basically when we turn, we all reflexively pick up a device when we have a question or want to know what year something happened or um, how to spell a word even. So that we pick up our smartphones just out of habit um, to learn something new, to do something, to discover information, of course, watching things when we're in line and waiting, and that um, all of those moments, there's a lot that AI can help interject within those moments to remind of what your work is and remind of opportunities for how your community can engage in that work. So like I said, look for, look for in the schedule <laughs> in the future, in quarter two of this year, um, we'll, we'll have someone do a full presentation about all the opportunities and the specific tools that can be used. But I think right now, like I said at the very beginning, is awareness, building awareness, having in mind, paying attention to the spaces that you're in, like that usability rule of that even you spend the most time not in your space, that you spend the most time somewhere else and paying attention to what, um, what tools exist there and, and how you feel um, when you're using them to have that incorporated back into the work that you do. And um, the last one, or second to last, is about the nonprofit and for-profit connection. Hopefully everyone um, who came today has built some great new um, relationships this last year. And maybe those relationships were built out of necessity. This is an example I particularly like because I'm sort of personally proud of it. It's this, um, the CEO of this um, marketing company is someone I went to high school with. And, um, and they came together with their local United Way and a couple grocery stores. And they created um, a website where they made it easy for um, you as an individual to buy a gift certificate to a local restaurant or a local business to basically put money into businesses, right? To um, even if that gift card was never redeemed, that business is helping, you know, is getting help staying afloat. And then at the same time, then whatever was bought, then that's the amount that was also then donated by these partners that came together for grocery assistance. And then kind of that one-to-one -one match and partnership. And these are the sorts of projects that can only be possible when entities join together. And um, basically that we've already seen the lines blur between what a for-profit is supposed to be and what a nonprofit is supposed to do and serve. And that that line is going to continue to blur. And so if you haven't already, um, then think, think about the partnerships that you already have. Um, think about what those partnerships have brought you, what you can bring more to those partnerships, what opportunities exist to expand the network that you exist in. Um, you're going to continue to see a rise of social enterprises and B corporations and um, again, that blur of, of lines that exist because it's, um, it's cross sector is what is going to continue to make, make change happen. And that um, a lot of times those are kind of personal relationships that we can leverage that I have someone I really trust and they work in a completely different environment than me, but that doesn't have to matter, right? That there can be um, ways of partnership and, and being creative together. And the last point is um, my little speech about self-care, right? Like all of us are going to do our job better when we take care of ourselves and when we care about our team. Um, I think 
that we've had to do that last year. We should always do that every year, even if there's not a pandemic. And hopefully there, you know, there won't be. Um, but th this is this is how all of these strategies are really going to come to life. Whatever from what we've talked about sticks with you, whatever you um, are thinking is most immediately actionable with the work that you're doing, you're gonna do that more successfully um, if you're aware of where you're at and where your team is at. So there's this um, Aristotle, we'll go in deep old philosophy. He says, moral excellence comes from a result of habit. We become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts. And so um, this is, that's a, a, a painting I have on my wall of let us dare to read, think, speak, and write of um, the idea of showing up. And then if we show up authentically, then um, people will feel it and know it. And that's where um, true authentic interactions and relationships and partnerships and change happens and our communities become better places. So that's the, the last one that's really about ourselves, but it's also about what makes all of this work possible and also um, something that we want to wake up to and continue then the next day. So on that, we have a lot of upcoming events. <laughs> they shared a few in the beginning, um, but we do have a full, a full calendar and lots of different great presenters who um, will be sharing on each of these. A lot of these are going to go into um, more of the weeds of like cybersecurity. We didn't talk about that at all today. And so the nuts and bolts of what that looks like for your nonprofit or Google Analytics, that is changing all the time. It's like, if you have not logged into Google Analytics in the last three months, it probably looks slightly differently. It's changing constantly. And so um, knowing to how to take advantage of what matters with what you're measuring and how you can better take action with that, as well as um, the 10 common accessibility issues. So a lot of that goes back to those rules in the very beginning that I shared. Hopefully everybody has gone to that website um, to think about our online spaces and how we're communicating to the community that we're working with, um, how they're able to get information um, and, and how to be prepared for mobile among just a few of the things that we'll talk about. So I would love in the few minutes that we have left of just to have either people take themselves off mute. Hopefully you have that power. If you don't, we can grant it or share in chat if you don't wanna talk. But I would love to know some of the lessons um, if we think about 2020 lessons that um, You've either learned that you know you're incorporating into this, this coming year, the strategy that you have, things that stuck out from what we've gone through today in rapid fire, um, just to share with each other kind of where you're at and what you see ahead. Lovely. Thank you so much, Janet. So uh, this is Eli in Vancouver, Canada. I'll go first just to break the ice. Um, I think my 2020 lesson is that all the things that I thought were too hard or impossible were actually super possible. So, you know, for me, really practically, getting grandparents onto Zoom, I would have said would be 100% impossible. And I was super wrong about that. So that was my big lesson, which is to rethink what I actually think is impossible because when there is a need, there is a way. <laughs> That's a great one, Eli. Um, I'll, I'll jump in with what, and Sunita, you want to go first? No, you go ahead. Okay. I'll just jump in with a quick one. Um, I work with several different nonprofits um, and uh, what we figured out is that this idea of virtual, and I think Jenna alluded to it a little bit, it's not going anywhere. And even when we start doing our events and meetings and some of the nonprofits I work with do kind of competition type um, events, uh, we are going to keep doing the virtual component as an add-on to the in-person when in-person starts back up again, because there's actually a lot of benefits to the virtual that we actually fought, of, fought against at first, like, no, 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 it could never happen virtually. But now that we've done it a few times, we're saying, you know what, actually, there's a lot of things that are better about virtual. Um, so how do we, once we start going in person, also maintain the betterness of what we learned about what virtual opens up. And I think even this Net Squared event is a perfect example. Even when we start having the events in person, we may you know, still set up a camera and still do the stream, whether it be on Zoom or Facebook Live or both, 
because why not let more people attend that aren't geographically able to, um, to come to the in-person? And there's just so many examples of that that I hear all over the place. Well, I guess I can I can go next to just my little two cents right here. The oh, how 2020 for me was, um, I think like for everyone else, it was a challenging year for all of us at so many levels. Um, just uh, uh, the day of face-to-face -face connections with the people, just emotionally, spiritually, so many other things. Um, so the 2020 has has taught us how to rise above all of the challenges and still find your way to to stay connected with people. Um, professionally, uh, I work with people directly. So my reason for joining here today was to, as I'm craving to, to speak to people and, and get in front of people and talk to them and get to know, find out how they are doing, how they really are doing in this time, um, how they're weathering through this storm. And so I would be very open and, and love to talk to people, and understand what they're going um, through at this point, if, if something I can help in any whatsoever way, I would love to connect with people um, through this, this forum also. And I can share my information. I just don't know how to send the information. If anybody would like to connect, I would, I would love to do that. That's what I've been doing while working virtually like we all are. That's great. You can pop it in chat, whatever type of contact information you're comfortable sharing if you're wanting to share it in that way. Um, I tried and it's not letting me. I'm going oh. into the chat. When you go into the chat, there's a little blue box there that says you're writing to everyone or just the speakers. So make sure it says everyone in meeting. I am clicking on the chat and oh, there you go. Now I got it, okay. of course. <laughs> All right, I'll send it through. Fabulous. Where else are folks with kind of the, the I think of stable versus new, not that those are in conflict, but how intentionally business as usual versus um, intentional experimentation are you looking at for the year ahead? Um, this is Denise and I would say I'm trying to understand better the marketing trend. Um, my church has never been the business which is a religious organization, never really was on Facebook or anything like that until the pandemic. So now trying to get them out there and understand the marketing trends of how to, you know, push them forward is um, a little complicated. So with me starting to come to these meetings is, I believe is just gonna help me with the technology because I'm technology savvy, but then there's some stuff that I really don't know nothing about. And that was like the AI and the IOT and the chat bots. That's something good that I picked up out of um, what you said. And then some of the tools, I know about Canva, but I didn't know about a lot of the other places that's good to just go, that you referenced that is good for me to go look at and see what I can get my hands involved with to help the ministry go forward. So in 2021, I'm looking forward to trying to understand it better because as y'all said, it's not going anywhere. Um, even when we go back to the building, we will be still in um, using Facebook, YouTube and all those other platforms. Yes, yeah, someone asked about slides and um, I'll send those out as a email afterwards with a link to it after we wrap up. And then and you can also, click everything that's a hyperlink. <laughs> so there are hyperlinks. I didn't notice Eli just put in the chat group that um, you can get 10 free Canva licenses for nonprofits. Um, and he put the link in there of where to get those. What else? Who has some insights that you'd like to share with everyone who came today? Hey there, everyone. Uh, this is Delena. 
Um, something that I found relevant just with the pandemic and everyone working at home, and this is kind of bouncing off of what we had talked about with self-care and how important that is, but kind of drawing this a very solid line between your work life and your personal life, because when you are in a home environment, those things can get very conflicted. And um, yeah, so just having that very solid line, I think, is always really important for everyone to keep in mind, especially in these times. Um, Whereas uh, I believe Sunita said, everyone is going through a different experience and different struggles. Um, so yeah. I love that. And the, the it's also um, the awareness to do that for yourself and the um, kind of the acceptance of knowing and supporting everyone you're with to do the same thing. I know it was a couple weeks ago, I attended my first Zoom funeral and then it just, the live stream ends, you know, and you're no longer at the funeral. And then all of a sudden there's your email. <laughs> like, well, I guess there's that new email that came in. I guess I'll reply. You know, that's not anything that would ever happen within going to a funeral. And so, um, I appreciate what you shared and just that awareness that we can have, like I said, for, for ourselves individually, but then the kind of space that we make sure to create for everyone that we're working with, knowing that that is a reality of um, the community that we're trying to talk to and have them give us donations and attend these events and that they're tired of attending. Um, and that sort of authenticity is going to, uh, it's, it's like the inside out movie inside out where it's like sadness um, has a lot better time helping uh, being bong, you need to watch Inside Out if you haven't seen this movie, <laughs> than like Joy running around and pretending like everything's okay. <laughs> um, I can go next. Great. Uh, my name's Stephanie. I am from Helen's Project. And I really liked what Adrienne had mentioned in the chat of just really acknowledging humanity in this last year. And um, I think on the nonprofit side of just not only with just our staff, but our clients too of really walking with people through life more authentically um, and learning that it's okay to take a step back, that work is not, you know, the most important priority. I think it's really allowed us to sit at home with our family and loved ones um, more intentionally as well as with our, our coworkers and community. So I think that is my biggest takeaway from the last year. Who else? I'd love to hear from a couple more people before we close out today. I want to know what Bobby's um, dog has learned from the uh, <laughs> the very very cute puppy there. <laughs> Uh, thank you. That's that is Gus Augustus. He's our uh, six-month-old lab boy, and uh, been a delight in our household. Not sure how much he's learned, although he's pretty smart. He may be smarter than I am. He's probably learned more than all of us. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, Jenna and Eli, for hosting this. Uh, it's been terrific. Um, we are talking about what we took away from uh, 2020, and I have learned to contact and uh, listen better maybe than I have before, and it's been much more convenient rather than have to travel to a seminar somewhere. So I see... Uh, lots of good things. In fact, in our ministry, we've made connections that we probably wouldn't have, never would have without having to go uh, virtual. And yet that opened the door for lots of people who uh, either could not or would not have been a part of our group otherwise. So uh, I typed in chat a little while ago, we're going to continue, even when we can meet in person again, we're going to continue to uh, uh, with our virtual connections. And as you said, Jenna, uh, it's here to stay. And 
uh, it's only uh, helped us do a better job. So thank you for your input and wisdom today. What's up, Jenna? Thank you guys for hosting this today. I uh, had a question for you, maybe for the, the, the whole group. Um, do you feel like email marketing is going to kind of go away, or is it just going to kind of be added to with other options as far as video marketing and the SMS marketing, like you mentioned? And for instance, for text messaging marketing, like how do you set that up? How do you begin to use that as an avenue to communicate with your with your donors or potential donors? Yeah, so lots of great questions there. So I email marketing is not as not going away. Um, I think I think that we're seeing it layered in with other types of strategies and that video, for example, is part of email marketing and that SMS is, um, I would still say is um, a supplement in some ways to what's happening in email that you're communicating different things in different channels. The starting point to getting in with SMS marketing, I would say would be look at the existing software that you have. It could be that the existing software, which will likely be your CRM system, um, perhaps has an add on ability um, for SMS campaign. And then there is some more um, general tools that then have connections in to connect with an existing CRM system. So I think the, the biggest value would be to see what you have already instead of trying to start fresh because the big key word with so many of these things is segmentation, that that's really the takeaway, whether it's SMS, whether it's email marketing, even video content, any kind of content creation. And if um, we didn't talk about content marketing much at all today, but the, the big purpose of content marketing too is also segmentation and targeting to those who know that they need this information more than this information, that engagement's going to happen in a better way. And so um, looking at the landscape of the tools that you already have, and then if there's not anything in place, there are a lot of um, uh, software that are available for SMS. And if you wanna send um, or message in contact information, we can follow up with some of what those tools are and the potential that then you can integrate with a system that you already have. If you can integrate in, then hopefully that means that you can take advantage of your filtering capabilities to use all the data and information that you have about your contacts, events that they've attended, when they've made donations, how long you've had relationships with them, all that custom data that is unique to what you collect in comparison to another organization, to then have your list that then from then the, the SMS tool or email marketing tool, then that's where you can control the actual language. But um, the, those are two very different things and can even engage different teams. The language development is one skill set and tool and the segmentation, the data review, the data collection process, kind of the data structure that you have within your technology is a whole other type of question. So those are sometimes in some organizations, even two different teams that need to come together in order to, um, to successfully have um, the communications that you want. So I, you had, I think you even had like one more question in there. So if I didn't cover everything that you asked, feel free to ask. Uh, I think you had the most, yeah, we're, I appreciate the response. Yeah, thank you. Great. Great, yeah, Adrian just popped my, um, my email in chat. So if anybody has any follow-up questions or comments, anything you wanna share, uh, feel free to copy that, let me know. And um, I love the upcoming events slide up. There are a lot of trainings coming up. Location doesn't matter. So feel free to share these with your community. So hopefully we can get the most out of. I know that this has been live streamed. This is also being recorded. So if there's elements of what we discussed today that you think others on your team would benefit from hearing, then you can have that copy to, to share and distribute. But thank you everyone for joining really on a, on a beautifully distracting day. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, all these things happening in the world. And um, to, yeah, to have you all take some time to join and look ahead intentionally with what you're doing this year and can learn from last year. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for bringing this community together. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Eli, for providing the platform for us. Well, I want to put you to work. Um, <laughs> if the two of you have got two minutes for me. Um, so we're planning a similar kind of trends event, bringing like that we want to sort of promote across like all of the Net Squared groups and you know and to tech soup. So I think we'll bring a couple hundred people out if it all works out well. 
And it's formatted really around like sort of the, a five or 10 minute, like what's your top trend? So, you know, so it's like this, but with sort of multiple presenters. Um, and I would love to have a member of your team come and do, uh, you know, one of those 10 minute uh, topics. I got really excited. I think I saw that in the chat too, around what's happening around chat, AI, you know, I don't want to totally put you in the spot if that's not your topic, but you think it's possible in the next three weeks to put together like a 10 minute overview, a couple of like, here's some interesting examples. What do you think? Well, that's the beauty of not having to be the, the expert of things, but the, um, what is it? The, where you find the information and you put it together. The like a curator, maybe. Curator, curator. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm always a better curator than the expert of all things, right? Like the, the dabbler of everything, master of one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe three or four, maybe five. Three or four. Thank you, Adrian. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that would be great. I do. I saw that. I mean, you should have seen the slide, that specific slide, like 10 minutes before when you saw me staring at my <laughs> screen <laughs> before we officially started. Like, what? I mean, these bullet points make no sense. There's so much to say. And the difference between how um, it's not just this business thing. I think we we think about targeting in such mm -hmm. this way as if it's about the, you know, the floral pants that are chasing me online everywhere I go. But there's a lot that we can take advantage of and, and do um, within organizations. Yeah, and I think there's a number of like from really simple things like, you know, there's some very basic tools built into your Facebook page yeah. already yeah, to obviously yeah. much more sophisticated things happening with like, you know, people who are doing, you know, help lines and, you know, suicide prevention, things like mm -hmm. that. So there's a number of different approaches to that. Yeah, no, that'd be great. There's a, there's a lot of really great examples um, for how it's been successfully used. And I think I prefer even the way where people can get started because I think the successful examples can be great in the moment and then really overwhelming. Like, well, that's a larger scale than what my organization is. <laughs> <laughs> like the excited and then despondent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's always the curse like, that's great for that organization, yeah. but I'm just a small scrappy startup. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think the short answer is yes, we'll put together something that's like a 10 minute thing. Don't know who the presenter yeah. will be yet, but Jenna and I will yeah. talk about it. Uh, but for the purpose of the others on the call here, can you put any information or share verbally how people can sign up for that bigger event that you are talking ah, about? Ah, yes. So the event doesn't exist yet. I hope to go live with it <laughs> this coming Monday. But if you go to basically the fancy new site that you're all going to learn a lot more about very soon, yeah, like okay. events.techsoup.org is going to hold all of TechSoup events, all of our community events. It's going to be the thing bringing it all together. I finally got permission to make this thing <laughs> a reality on Friday. Um, so give me a couple months to start bringing it all over. But this event is going to be one of the, the first places where we get to sort of test out the new platform. And so yeah, so events, event? sorry, go ahead. Yeah, events, plural, .techsip .org. Um, and You'll see that's where ultimately all TechSoup events will live in one place. It'll be so, so sensible. <laughs> Got it. That's great. So yeah, everyone look at chat if you haven't already to notice the new link. That looks like Perfect. Well, zero. then I will follow up with an email, give you some time to plot and scheme what this, this event could look like, this theme within the event could look like. Um, and I've got like a little intake form for you to say like, okay, we know who our presenter is going to be. And I know it's short notice, but if you could get something in by the end of day Friday, <laughs> I'd love to go Monday, knowing that if you had to change your mind later or like, oh, someone else is available instead, it's not the end of the world. But basically I'm just looking for like, what is the log line? Like what is the yeah. topic and three bullet points? Like it will cover these things. So don't sweat it too much. It's all good. Okay. Lovely. Emails are coming your way. Super delighted to have your engagement with that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right. Yeah, thanks, everyone, so much for joining. Thank you so much for putting this on. Have a beautiful rest of your day.